right. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another Conline stream. I am here with my overhead camera setup that I do not want. I don't want a browser open. We are here to do analog conlanging. <laughs> so, um, what am I doing and why? Today, I'm going to start, I'm probably going to do two of these, um, one this week and one in two weeks, potentially, um, to explain, I'm just making sure everything's set up for the stream, um, I'm going to explain something that people a have asked me many times in the past, because um, I've been making conlangs for a very long time, um, as almost as long as I can remember. Um, and one of the things with making conlangs is um, there are a lot of moving parts to a conlang, right? Because there are lots of different aspects of a language. Um, and I've streamed conlang streams before where I've made conlangs or worked on conlangs that already exist. And one of the things um, that I use is sheets. I like to use sheets or um, documents, like word processing documents. I used to pretty much only use word processing documents, but I've switched to sheets just because I like to be able to put the different parts of the language onto different sheets. And you've seen how I've done that in other videos and streams. Um, but, um, I haven't always <laughs> used either of those tools to make conlangs. I started out making conlangs on pen and paper, <laughs> which shouldn't be too surprising, uh, but some people are surprised when they find out that I used to make conlangs, like, sitting in the car, um, in the back of a car <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, I would just, wherever I went, have like a little tiny notebook, mini notebook, um, that I would mostly use to make conlangs or take notes on language stuff in general. Um, but one of the things I did most often when I was going somewhere was I would always have a notebook and I would be making a conlang or working on a conlang I already had. Um, so I'm going to share, I guess, how I do that, how I did that, but maybe in a more straightforward way than I actually probably did it <laughs> um, in the past. Because when I was younger, um, I was not very good at taking notes on everything I thought. Um, I kept a lot of stuff in my head. I'm not that way anymore. I cannot ke keep track of so many things. I think just being an adult means you have a lot more to keep mental track of. So I've become a journaler, as you can already know from my other streams, I journal, and part of that is to keep less stuff floating around in my head. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit more explicit with my notes than I probably was when I was younger, definitely than I was when I was younger, um, just to include more steps. But it is all doable on pen and paper, um, and I'm going to show you how. One of the things... Um, to talk about though when making a conlang is like what kind of conlang is it and I've talked about this many times when explaining conlangs or um, showing my process when making conlangs and I think the thing that is going to determine the biggest difference in process between making a um, between the two kinds of ways of making a conlang on pen and paper that I'm going to show you is if the language is a priori or a posteriori. The processes were different for me, um, depending on what kind of conlang I was making. Um, and so I'm gonna show how I do that. There are definitely other ways you could go about this, of course, but this is the way younger me <laughs> would go about it. Um, but I'm gonna try to, as best I can, sort of mature the process to be more useful to you. Um, so 
that is what we're going to do here today. Um, so today's conlang, I'm actually going to go in the opposite order than I probably typically would. I'm actually going to start with an a priori language. We're going to make an a priori conlang on paper <laughs> today. <gasps> At least start an a priori conlang on paper. Um, so there are lots of different things to consider. And if you've seen my conlang with me series from a while ago, a <laughs> long time ago, um, then you may have seen sort of the different categories to think about when making a conlang. I'm going to see if I can zoom in at all. Can I choose where I zoom in? Not really. No, I can't. Okay. Okay. Zooming in a bit more here. Um, at the top, I am going to write um, the sort of different categories that I'm going to need to think about for this conlang to get it started. And I'm going to just write um, uh, I'm using print for your benefit. I typically would not use print here. Um, <laughs> A priori. My print is not very good, um, I will say. <laughs> um, but my cursive is probably going to be illegible to most people. <laughs> so I'm going to try to use print here. A priori. I'm just kind of using a normal sans serif font here because I don't know um, if my other print that I usually use is going to be very legible. A priori. Conlang. And I'm going to leave a space here after it. I'm just putting a dot here. I'm going to leave a space for the name of it here because it doesn't have a name yet. Um, and there are some different things I want to think about. I want to think about, and I'm going to make this sort of like a checklist. I'm going to have like boxes, Let's do boxes. I usually do dots, but I'm going to do boxes here. Um, I want to think about the... goals of the conlang and that will determine my choices with the other things. Um, I want to think about the with an a priori language I actually tend to think of things in I guess the reverse order from what I typically do with a, a posteriori language. Um, I'm going to think about um, The semantics, semantic things I want to express. I'm going to think about the syntax. I'm going to think about the morphology, which will largely be determined by what the syntactic choices are. Um, morphology. And I want to think about the phonology, um, and then once I got that figured out, if there's an orthography for it, how am I going to do that? How am I going to represent it in writing? So that's the situation here. Um, oh, I'm being told that there's something weird going on with my feed. Let me check that out. Twitch, this is the worst time for you to give me an ad. Um, it could not be a worse time. Um, let me see here. My chat here. Oh yes, okay. I am not being able to see my chat. That is, that is a problem. Um. Very strange. Okay, I guess I'll just have to keep Twitch open <laughs> on 
in my browser um, for now. Last week, the I mentioned that my um, OBS doc for the Twitch chat was gone. Um, I reconnected it, and I even tested it uh, yesterday, and um, it is now not working. It says it's quiet. It says that no one's saying anything, but when I open the browser, there is stuff in the chat. So I'm not sure why that's not working. <laughs> um, the only thing I can do is inspect it, which is not what I want to do. I want to... Hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, I, my Twitch chat thing that was working yesterday is not working today. Which goes to show, even when I start half an hour early to check that everything is working, it still goes wrong. <laughs> this is great. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to keep Twitch open on my browser because I have no other way of seeing the chat <laughs> otherwise. Um, okay, so... Um, what we're going to do first is talk about the goals. Um, and so to figure out what my goals here are, I'm doing this to explain <laughs> so my goal of this con line. Let's start here. Um, is to, um, the goal, demonstrate a non prairie language. That seems kind of obvious and meta, but I want it to be example-y, right? So I'm gonna like try to think of things that would come up for other people making operary languages and use that to sort of guide what I do in this con line. Um, I might, I do want to do something cool, something fun. <laughs> um, I don't really intend to use this con line personally for anything because um, this is an example language. So. Um, that means I'm not going to care about certain things that I typically care about a lot when I'm making conlangs. I'm not going to restrict myself um, in a lot of ways. So I think what's going to happen with that is I'll just say um, let's say single use. If I do come back and use it, then that's just a bonus. But that, those are my goals. Um, I guess this should be dashes, not dots. Um, those are the goals. So that's goals. Check. Okay. So um, given that it's an example con line that's meant for fun and for single use purposes, I am going to think about what types of things I'm going to use it to get across. So I think I just want really basic physical examples and then maybe some like abstract examples. Um, and what I like to do, I mean, I like to do this in my conlangs in general when I'm making a priori languages, is I like to have a lot of, I maybe overdo this, but I think it helps my brain, <laughs> so that's why I do it, is I use a lot of physical metaphor for non-physical things. Sorry, something was just falling off of <laughs> my desk, and I was fixing it before it actually did fall. Um, so I like to use a lot of physical metaphors for things, so if I do have abstract concepts, they're going to be sort of like metaphorical extensions of physical concepts, especially since this is going to be an a priori single use language. It's going to be sort of like a small number of words that I'm even going to make for this. Um, and I want to get the biggest bang for my buck in terms of those words, um, which might have some implication for the syntax. Um, um, I think I might have it be a little bit more flexible with parts of speech that might be useful for that purpose. Um, if I'm just kind of demonstrating how I do an a priori language, um, one easy thing to do is like re either redraw the boundaries between syntactic categories, which is what parts of speech are, syntactic categories, or not have very clear boundaries at all. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'll say semantic considerations. I'll say that. Gosh, writing in print is so odd for me. <laughs> it's so odd for me. Um, I guess I'll write tasks over here too. Like tasks. 
semantic considerations. Um, I'll say, I think I want more open parts of speech. Kind of going on to the next line, but I'll fix that in the next line. Open parts of speech. Um, I'm going to have, which is more of a syntax thing, it is a semantic thing, but it's going to mean things for the semantics of words that they can kind of shift around a bit um, in terms of what they're doing in the sentence. I want physical metaphors for abstract concepts. I'm just going to say abst for that. Um, contexts. I apologize if my print is hard to read. There, this is the reason I don't write in print. It always comes out really ugly looking. <laughs> Unless I use all caps and it looks a little bit better. Um, I, I usually write in all caps in print or I do very stylized calligraphy, which will not be as fast. Um, is there any other semantic stuff I wanna keep in mind? Um, part of the physical metaphors thing is I wanna be able to draw what I'm explaining. Since I'm doing this on pen and paper, I can't like pull up images to explain anything like that. So I'm gonna just um, um, this kind of goes with the fit of physical metaphors thing. Um, let's say visually. Wow, I already forgot a letter. Visually. I just skipped the A in visual, whoops. Visually expressible, I guess. I can't think of how to spell expressible if it's an A or an I. I'm going to go with I. That seems right. <laughs> now that I'm looking at it, it seems wrong. I'm spelling expressible. I, I, I don't even know if expressible is a word. I'm pretty sure it's not. Um, but it is now. That's how it works. It, it's a word now. All right. Um, those are some of the semantic things I want to keep in mind. Um, I don't know if there's any other semantic stuff. I'm not really worried about colors. I'm not going to bust out my color, um, color pencils or highlighters or anything like that for this uh, stream, so I'm not going to worry about color terms. Um, maybe some stuff with pronouns might be something I want to think about here. Um, if it's not a word, it doesn't matter how to spell it. That's so true. Ascended moment. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Syntax. What do I want to do with the syntax? I, um, I can't cross it off. I haven't started. Okay. Um, going with the sort of open parts of speech thing, if I'm doing that, I could kind of go two directions with this. I can either use word order or particles to make the semantic rules very clear um, because my parts of speech are very open. Um, I could close the parts of speech a bit. I could make it so that like some things just are verbs, some things just are nouns, some things just are adjectives, some things just are particles. Um, or I could not be rigid with word order, even though I have open parts of speech, and do something else with the syntax. I could do some sort of like um, the way that modification works or topic marking or something like that can make a relatively flexible word order still parsable. Um, so this is going to be something to think about a lot. Um, and I think this is where we need to start drawing some stuff. Um, so let's see here. Let's start with an example sentence. So for syntax, I'm actually going to draw something. I'm going to draw a few things actually. I'm going to draw a deciduous tree. <laughs> Okay, there's a deciduous tree. 
Okay. And um, I'm going to draw a person kind of leaning back under the tree. Okay. You can't see it yet because my, my hand is covering it, but there we go. Um, Okay, cool. So we have a person under a tree. How do we want to express that idea of a person being under a tree? Um, so many languages would have like a stative kind of construction. In English, we say a person is under a tree. We use a copula and then we use a sort of um, locational adverb. Um, uh, a locational adverbial expression and it's a prepositional phrase that we're using. Under the tree is a prepositional phrase. It's adverbial to the copula and then we have the copula. So person is under a tree. A lot of languages would use state of verbs like they, to be under, <laughs> to be a verb. Um, and then tree would be sort of a modifier of under, <laughs> the verb be under. Um, Another thing you could do is have, um, hmm, what else could we do here? Well, there are a lot of things I can think about doing, but um, what the way to kind of make this a bit simpler is I'm gonna next to this picture list the concepts or like the things to get across, like the ideas present here. Depending on the language, you can splice it in many different ways, actually with how many concepts there are, and I'll demonstrate that. So we could say that there are two sort of entities here. There's the person and the tree. And then there's one relationship, which is under, right? Or up against, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say under for simplicity. We could say up against, because they're leaning up against it or something like that. But we could also say, that there's more. There's um, there's a tree, right? There's, I mean, there's the ground, but that doesn't matter as much. But there is a person. There's the concept of being under. Um, but another thing is that this is a state, right? Um, and that's what we use is to get across in English. We say the person is under a tree. Um, and that state could be switched out for something. We could say a person goes under a tree. Like if I, if I drew an arrow <laughs> and had a person going under the tree. Actually, let's, let's do that picture right next to it. person I'm gonna put some lines to show that they're going in that direction um, put some air behind them so we've got a tree again we've got a person again we've got a we've got under being a place right it's gonna be a relationship but we've also got motion here so under here is the place where the person is in relation to the tree. And under here is the destination that the person is going to. That's, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that the person is resting and under the tree is the location of that. Here, a person is moving and then under the tree is the location of that. So there are actually a lot of different ways to connect the different concepts here. Um, right? So you could have under and tree be like related in both and then person state and person motion. But alternatively, you could have under be the state here and person and tree are just kind of vibing. Those are the two things. Um, and what you need to express is who's under who. Um, or you could have under and motion be connected, like under being like the destination that you're moving towards and person and tree just kind of vibrate and you need to again say who's 
moving towards being underneath who? Is the tree moving to be under the person or is the person moving to be under the tree? Now, in that situation, if you do the latter, there are a few ways to make it clear, right? If a person is the mover or the tree is the mover, um, we could use some kind of syntactic, um, uh, like morphosyntactic alignment tool. That's what most languages do. They have an alignment and they'll have like a person be taking a syntactic role in the sentence and tree taking a syntactic role in the sentence that makes it clear who is what. Um, so like person would be, we would say like an agent of motion here um, and tree would not. And here, person, we wouldn't really say that they're an agent because they're just vibing. They could just be like a theme <laughs> or a patient, depending on how you want to label that. Um, but they just are existing there. Um, many languages will say that the agent and the, the actor here are the same kind of thing because they're both the ones doing the either the state or the motion. So we would call that like a, a subject in a nominative accusative language or just in general, um, even if it's not nominative accusative, you might call that a subject if they're then used as the pivot for more sentences. Um, that's one way to do it. Another thing we could do is we could build a animacy hierarchy, right? Um, so if you think about it logically, who's more likely to mo be moving under a tree? A person? Is it more likely that a person's gonna move under a tree? Is it more likely that a tree's gonna move under a person? Probably the former. Same with a person. Are they more likely to be under a tree or is a tree more likely to be under them? It's possible for a tree to be under a person if you climbed above it, but usually we would say you're on top of the on the top of the tree and not above the tree unless you're in a plane or something. So again, just sort of using like the logic of animacy, languages can just get that across without needing to do any kind of labeling, or they might do both. A lot of languages do both. Um, but what do we want to do in this operator language? If we want it to be like kind of simple um, and intuitive so that we could then extend that to physical metaphors. So there are different things we could do. We could, hmm, I'm just trying to think of what I want to do. So one thing we could do, oh, I, I didn't even say another possibility. Another possibility is that you just have separate words for this. Like English is, English does a combination of those things, but it also does have separate words that it uses to get this across. English says is here and it says goes here. Um, so we have two different verbs there. Um, another thing you can do is have pr different prepositions for under here. The person is at being under the tree versus the person is towards being under the tree or something like that, that's another thing you could do. Um, in either case, you need four words if you do that. You need a word for each of these concepts in some way. Um, whereas it's also possible to do three words, but use some kind of syntax to get this differentiation across. Um, that's one thing to think about. I'm going to actually draw another picture before we end up making any kinds of decisions or anything like that. Um, I want to involve two animate things because animacy can be really easy here, right? There, there could be two, um, two entities, but one of them is clearly not animate. I want two people in the, my next picture. I'm going to have um, or maybe I'll do two animate things that aren't people. Um, I'll do two animals that might be easier to get across and we'll just treat the animals like as if they were people for simplicity's sake we're not going to differentiate human non-human animacy right now um, let's do a what can I draw <laughs> I'm not a good artist if you can't, couldn't tell that um, we're gonna draw a Hmm. 
Ooh, let's do a bird and a person. We could do one animal, one person. That works. And let's make it like a crow or something like that. And I'm going to have a person here. Um, and there's the crow. Wow, that was not a straight line. There we go. And I'm going to have lines here. The crow is about to attack this person. <laughs> the crow. So I'm trying to say the crow s attacks the person here. <laughs> so we have sort of three things going on here. We have two entities. We have a crow and we have a person again. Um, and then our action, we have motion. But it's not just motion. It's an attack here. Um, so this this gets really tricky because we have a crow, we have a person, and we have a tech. And crow and person are, I would say, for our purposes, we're going to say that they're equally animate. You can't just kind of use animate. You can see, because people could attack crows quite easily. You could easily switch this around and have a person, you know, shooting a crow or attacking a crow or something like that. Sorry to get so gruesome, but um, basically. These guys are equal in animacy. You can't, like, you could set up an animacy hierarchy. We could still do that and say that people are more, more animate than crows or the reverse. And then we could do something with order, right? We could say, like, the more animate thing typically comes before the less animate thing or vice versa. And then we can switch it when that hierarchy is reversed or mark the action in some way to indicate that the... Um, action is going the opposite way of the animacy hierarchy. That's what direct inverse languages do. They'll say that if person is higher and crow is lower, uh, then this would be an inverse sentence because the lower animacy thing is attacking the higher animacy thing as opposed to the typical expectation. Then if you, if you said like person attack crow with no modification, it would be the person doing the action because they're higher animacy wise. Um, that would be one solution to the tree situation. Um, here, we could say the person has higher animacy than the tree, so we don't really need to mark motion at all. Um, um, what we would do with state would still be a question. How we want to get that across would still be a question. Now, that wouldn't really solve that whole thing that we were talking about. Um, really, the issue with these two pictures is that we have two different things happening in relation to the entities, but they still have the relationship with each other. It's pretty much the same. Um, that's one way of looking at it, at least. We could also say that the relationship is different. Um, it just depends on how we get it. We want to get it across in this language. Um, but this kind of shows we need a way, some way, to show that the person is not the attacker and that the crow is the attacker in this situation. Um, let's do one more thing. I want to I wanna do one more example, and I'm going to try to keep the line kind of where it is here. Um, I'm going to have a rabbit. OK, we have a rabbit. I don't know why the rabbit's so high off the ground. Maybe they're on a hill. OK, yeah, they're on a hill. Um, OK, we've got a rabbit. We've got a bunny rabbit. OK, cool. And we're also going to have a, let's see. Can I draw something that resembles a, um, I need another animal. <laughs> I live in proximity to a rabbit, but won't eat it. I don't want, I don't want anything that's going to eat the rabbit. Um, let's do, I do a gopher. <laughs> Am I able to draw a gopher? Maybe I should draw a raccoon. I don't know. Do raccoons eat rabbits? I don't think so. Tortoise. Tortoise is a good one. Oh yeah, tortoise and the hare. That one should be obvious. Okay. Um, we have a we have a tortoise. Okay. I'm not <laughs> not really showcasing my artistic skill today. Okay. Got a tortoise. Okay. And um, 
what's going to happen is there is a carrot. Ooh, it's kind of floating here just for demonstration's sake. And the tortoise is giving the carrot to the rabbit. It's a gift. It's a consolation prize for losing the um <laughs> losing the race that the hare lost. I'm going to say this is a hare now. The tortoise is like, "Hey, I'm sorry that you lost, but here's a carrot." <laughs> kind of serves you for running so fast. <laughs> um okay, so we've got four things present here. For sure. Um we've well, okay, not for sure. Say for sure, but do we have four things for sure? Um, I'm gonna say that we have four things, at least for now. We have, we have the tortoise. Thank you for the tortoise suggestion. We have the, um, we have the hare. We have the carrot. And then we have the concept of giving or a gift. Um, I'm gonna say gift, but I'm gonna put these sort of like concepts in parentheses here. Um, um, protect because you because like you don't it's not a thing you're seeing it's not like a thing you're drawing they're not things like state you can see that it's a state but you don't see a state here sitting there also you don't see a motion I'm drawing it with the lines but again my point here is that these are like the relationships you have to get across under is also a relationship we have to get across too to be fair um, but yeah, we have a tortoise, we have a hare, we have a carrot, and we have the concept of it being given from the tortoise to the hare. Um, so that's something that we have to be able to express in this scenario, if we're drawing this scenario. So what we can do, what we wanna do, is sort of come up with a way of labeling, at least for now while we're trying to figure out what we wanna do syntactically, each of these components in the language. So um, for each situation, it's a little bit more unique. Um, I'll actually, I'll start by labeling each picture. I'm going to say A, B, C, D. Okay. So for A, um, the entities we have are the tree, the person, and the relationships we have are, um, I'm gonna put a space between them, stay or rest, because that's what the person's doing, and under, which is the relationship. So stay and rest is the relationship to the person and being under the tree. And then under itself is a relationship between the person and the tree or the tree and the um, staying. <laughs> Again, we could kind of draw the lines in different possible ways. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna like come up with labels for each of these for now. So the tree is what? What is the tree in this scenario? Um, what is the person in this scenario? What is staying <laughs> in this scenario? And what is under in this scenario? Um, I think I'm going to say, I'm going to call under a location. That's what I typically do in conlinks. I wouldn't always do this, but for now I'm going to say under is a location relationship. Um, and it's something that, something in the sentence has with the tree. The tree has a relationship with under in some way. That's maybe a little bit more tied linguistically, um, in most languages doesn't have to be in this one, but in most languages, under and tree really go together in a deeper way than any of these entities go with each other. Um, in, at least in English and many other languages, that's the case. Tree then feels like, one way we could put it is that it's more specification of where under is, like under what? <laughs> Um, but it is the first thing I drew. That's something I do want to note, is that the tree is the first thing that I drew. Um, we could say even that the tree is like um, a topic. 
<laughs> like the tree is really what we're what what stands out here is the tree um again it's the first thing i drew um it's the thing that stands out most i think in the sentence to me um so we could call the tree a topic we could also call the tree more specification of under so it's like a sub location so i'm not sure what we want to call tree yet person though person is just vibing there person i'm not sure what to call them um but hmm Yeah, I'll come back to the situation. I think this is actually the one that has gives me the most pause, and I'm not surprised by that. I'm actually not surprised that the state of sentence is the one that I have the most trouble with because we haven't made any decisions yet. Let's go to a more active sentence, but it's an active and transitive um, is what we would typically call this. Um, we've got a tree again. We've got person. We've got the concept of motion towards. I'll just say motion two, and then we've got under again. Okay, so that is um, the second one, and I think I'm gonna call motion toward, uh, so under the location again, I'm gonna say. But it's also kind of a destination. Location here is location static. Again, it's a stative situation is what I was calling it earlier. Here it's location non, well, I mean, it's static, but it's not the static location of the person. It's the resulting location of the person. Um, uh, so motion two is really the thing here. Um, oh yeah, for these, I'm gonna call it an event. I think I'm gonna call it an event. What's the event here? The event here is resting. Um, and that's sort of the relationship the person has to being under there is the event, um, the event of resting. That's what's happening is resting. Here, what's happening is motion. I'm going to call that the event here, too. A lot of languages will then make events verbs. Events tend to be verbs. They're not always verbs, but events tend to be verbs. Um, uh, the tree and the person, I again, here the person, I would call them a mover, or, um, yeah, I'll call them a mover, which many languages would just call a subcategory of agent, a person who does something intentionally. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit more specific here and do mover. Here, I guess I'll do rester. Some languages might call that an agent. Some languages would say, no, that's not an agent. They're not doing anything. They're just resting. Um, so we can make that decision of what we want to categorize as a rester. Um, and then tree here, again, it seems to be like under what, right? Again, I'm not so sure what to do with tree. And I think, again, because this tends to be what we would call an intransitive verb, um, but some languages would actually make this transitive <laughs> um, and make tree it like an object here. Um, like the person is undering a tree or like a person is turning the tree into their covering <laughs> or something like that. Um, there are different ways to express that potentially. All right, and now C, we've got the crow. We've got the person and the crow. I'm going to call them the <laughs> attacker and the person I'm going to call them the victim <laughs> that you would usually be considered a sub Oh, I just realized you can't see what I'm writing down here. I'm going to move this up a bit, um, which again, attacker is usually going to be a subtype of agent. Um, and a victim would be a subtype of, um, patient there. So this would be like a direct object or something in most languages and attacker would be the subject in most nominative accusative languages. Now the relationship, the thing that's happening here is the attack. Um, so that's the event. Um, and then, okay, scenario D is we've got a tortoise. Again, okay. we've got a hare, we've got a carrot, and then we've got giving as the event. 
Okay. And I just want to emphasize that this is one way of thinking about this. Like thinking about each picture as an event and saying what is happening, that is the like maybe the most common way to like m think about this in a meta sense that languages will do. They will view things happening as events and then they'll use verbs to describe those events. That's what most languages do. Um, but theoretically, there are other things you could do. If you want to experiment with like a philosophical language or a um, engineered language that doesn't do this, that is possible. I'm just keeping things as simple as I can right now. Um, so I'm just going to say that there are events. Um, so what role do each of these have in the event? So the tortoise is the giver, the what we call the donor. Um, the hare is the recipient, the receiving the carrot and the carrot is the gift which people will usually call a theme it's a thing that's just kind of there and not doing anything kind of like the rester was so some languages would, would say that the rester is a theme and the gift is a theme they'd be marked similarly um, donor is usually considered a kind of agent in most languages there is at least one language that actually has donor in its own case called the pegative um, Recipient is kind of its own thing. We could make them a kind of patient, kind of like we, would, we could be saying that the hair is more like the person and the attack. Um, other languages that say that the gift is the patient of giving, um, that's what most non legislative accusative languages do, though not all. Um, they will say that the carrot is more like the person. It's the thing being given. If giving is the event, what is the gift? It's the carrot. Just like if attacking is the event, what's the who's being attacked? It's the victim. Um, but of, of course, you could probably imagine that being different, right? We could say the event is the attack. So what's the attacker seems to be more closely tied to the attack there potentially, um, but usually not. <laughs> usually, we think if it's an attack, there needs to be something you're attacking. Because someone could get attacked by something that's not intentionally attacking them. Um, although we would usually say that that's not an attack. Um, we would say that that's an accident or something. <laughs> like they were attacked by a cupboard falling down or something. Will we say there's an attacker there? Um, we would probably just say that attack is probably not the right word. Um, but it depends on the language. So what are we going to do about tree here? Because I think that tree in these intransitive intransitive in most languages sentences is kind of important for how we're going to do the rest of this i think um i think it might help actually to first decide what we're going to group and for this maybe i will pull out some colors um, like what are we going to say are more similar? Um, I'm going to use red for our first grouping. So we were saying, I was mentioning how typically mover and attacker and donor are considered like the same type of thing. They're, they're, they're like what many languages would call agents. They're the ones, sorry, I think I just scratched the um, mic with my pen. They're, they're usually considered agents, like the person who causes the attack is the attacker. The person who is the agent of motion, the person who causes the motion is the mover. And the person who causes there to be a gift at all is the giver. So most languages would say that those are agents and treat them similarly. I did mention there is a language um, that has a pegative. I'm not remembering what language that is. If I do remember it, I'll put it in the description of the YouTube upload of this um, that has a separate donor case. But typically, they're, they'd all be called agents. So for now, I'm going to tentatively uh, like group those. I'm going to put a like, little red dot next to them to say that maybe they're going to be treated the same way. I might change my mind about that, though. Um, for Mm, okay, now the two, I think the two sentences that have the most in common potentially with like things being labeled the same, the way I'm thinking right now, is the crow attack and the um, 
uh, tortoise giving the carrot to the hare thing. Um, because in both of these sentences, we have two, two like animate things involved, and there's something that's happening to both of them or with both of them involved. Um, the hare's receiving something, and the tortoise is giving something here. The crow is attacking, and the person's being attacked here. The tree isn't really doing anything in either sentence, but in this one, the person isn't doing anything, and in this person, in this one, the person is doing something. At least that's one way we could think about it. If we want to treat resting as not doing anything, um, I mean, resting is doing something, um, but linguistically, we could choose to say that they're just there and they're not doing an action intentionally. They're turning their intentions off to relax. Um, but the question, and this is something that m languages have to usually figure out, um, and it's one thing that differentiates many languages between each other, is which of these two parts of this exchange are more like the victim of the attack here. If we call this victim of the attack the patient, which is usually what it is, um, is a recipient more like a patient or is a gift more like a patient of the giving that's happening thanks to the donor? The donor's causing the giving to happen. Is it happening to the hair or is it happening to the carrot? Um, and languages will make different choices here. When they choose the carrot, which is a very common thing for languages to do, we call this, we call the carrot a patient, or um, if it's a nominative accusative language, we'll call it an object, a direct object. And then the hair is given some other case, usually like dative or something like that. Um, so we have gift being like the victim, gift being like the person being attacked, it's being given, and then hair is who's receiving it. Other languages that have what's called a, sec a secundative or secundative case, they will mark the carrot as um, a secundative. Some, some, they'll use some other case for carrot, and then hair will be treated like a patient here. So we'll say like the, the hair is more like the person um, in this sentence, getting attacked. Like the hair is being given something, just like the person is being attacked by something. And then the carrot is then like its own thing. It's like a separate thing. It's the gift that's being given. So it's sort of like treating this arrow like this arrow. We're saying these arrows are the same because we're going from one thing to another thing. An important thing to note here though is in this kind of sentence, both of them are not always animate, right? The, the crow could be attacking a ball and it would be sort of the same situation of like, the victim is the ball here. It doesn't have to be a person. Um, and that's why many languages will say they're the same. Carrot and attacky are the same in these situations because the giving is, the carrot is the gift. The person is the attacker or the ball is the attack, the tacky, sorry. And then recipient is different. So that's a decision I have to make. <laughs> Which one is more similar to the victim, um, the gift or the recipient? And that will sort of like inform some of the other decisions in, especially here, because many languages, if they say that the gift is more like the person, then the recipient is something else. And that recipient is often treated more like the tree in this sentence. Um, or at least under, maybe, maybe more like under in this one, in the second sentence in B, where, where is the person going? They're going to be under the tree. Where is the gift going? It's going to the hair. So many languages will have a dative that's also what we call allative where it's like motion towards is grouped with recipientness. That's a really common thing. Not every language does that. Sometimes things will be separated out and that could be useful, but many languages will group those two things, especially if I want like not a lot of cases <laughs> to be distinguished. That is one way I could go. So if I say that the recipient is like under the tree in the second sentence, then that would be like a dative kind of thing or a um, allative kind of thing. And then, then the carrot would be like a victim. 
if I choose the hair, the recipient, to be like the victim, then I have to figure out what the gift is and what the gift is most like. <laughs> and I don't think the gift is like any of the things in A or B. I think the gift is its own thing. Um, now we could say that none of these are similar. <laughs> we could say like a person is not a recipient or not a gift. Um, or, or, a, or if it's a ball that the crow is attacking a ball is not like a gift and it's not like a recipient, in which case we'd have even more cases or we could do something else with this. Um, I think, I don't do second dativs very often, but I kind of want to. <laughs> I kind of want to make, um, I kind of want to make the hair like the victim, um, the, the hair like the person here and say that those are both receiving the action. The hair is what's getting the gift. The person is what's getting the attack. <laughs> Um, which makes gift, the carrot, something different. Um, and I don't know what that carrot is. Now, part of the reason tree is tripping me up here, or not tripping me up, but tree is like kind of floating here, is because in a lot of languages, if under is being treated like the location, then tree is just a modifier to under. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, that's what I did with these lines up here. Um, but I don't have to do that. Because what I could do is I could not splice these things, right? I was saying like, you could say that there are four things, you could say that there are three things here. Because um, what I was considering is potentially making the um, state be expressed in some way by the order or by some other mechanism, whatever mechanism we're using to mark the um, entities in these sentences. So I guess what I still need to do is who's the rester like? Is the rester most like, is the rester like the victim? <laughs> Are they like the recipient? Um, yeah, are they like the, the victim or the recipient? Or are they like the mover, donor, attacker? Or are they their own thing? <laughs> like the gift is. Um, in which case I could have a, some kind of like tripartite um, alignment where I have like agent, patient, theme or something like that. Um, that's an option. I could, I could have the rester be like the gift. Like the gift is just being tossed from one person to another just like the person is just kind of vibing under the tree and nothing's being done to them. Kind of like, I mean, something, it, we could say that something's being done to the carrot, but we're not saying that. We're saying that the hair is the one getting something done to them. And the, the carrot's more like the media <laughs> that you're giving. How are you giving it? With a, with a carrot. Um, yeah, so. This is, this is a little bit tricky. So I think what I want to do I think here I want tree or I guess under the tree is the destination connected to location. But I think I want it to be treated like a patient. I think I think I want the tree. to be the patient there. Um, whereas I think here, hmm. and I don't know what tree is here. I think I want the rester to be 
treated like a patient. I think that's what I want. Because they're not doing anything. Um, hmm. Wacky idea, but what if the gift is like an instrument? Oh, yeah, no, I was just thinking of that. The, the, the uh, carrot's like an instrument. What I was about to say is actually even wackier. I think I'm going to have the carrot. Because I'm going to do something wacky here. I think under... I think I'm going to I'm going to verbify under in both of these. Okay. I think I'm going to verbify both of these. Um, and what I'm going to do, I mean, attack is going to get its own verb. I'm going to actually draw like a triangle there. That's going to be a verb. Locate under is going to be a verb or the equivalent of a verb. Under is going to be a verb here. I think. Um, or maybe motion is going to be a verb. Maybe move is going to be a verb. And then under is going to be the patient. Entry is just going to modify. Hmm, I don't know if I like that. Um, I think under is going to be a verb in both of these. But my idea was what if carrot is my verb? Here. <laughs> what if carrot is a verb? <laughs> is what I'm saying. Um, I'm thinking. Um, like giving a carrot as a verb. <laughs> of course, the, the thing with that is like, if, if we're treating donor like an agent and hair like a patient, um, the, the potential dangers that could be interpreted as like, the tortoise is turning the carrot into a hair. Um, but I'm gonna say that that's not happening. I'm, while there is like an idea of cause underlying me with agent, I'm not going to have it be equivalent to the meaning of to cause to be, I think, here. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's going to mean transform. I think it's just going to mean to give carrot, to carrot you. So if I give you a, um, if I give you a pie, I would say I pie you. That doesn't mean I'm turning you into a pie in this language. It would mean I am bequeathing a pie unto you. <laughs> Um, that's sort of what I'm thinking here. So I'm thinking your your gift, since the gift, like I'm going to equate the gift with the act of giving, I think is what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to have like the giver gi gifts someone. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not just sec secondative. It's like the verb is the secondative. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do here is, in this sentence, I think I'm going to do something really wacky. And I'm going to say that the tree is actually the big honcho in this sentence. You said, if there's a cool, if there's cool verb incorporationiness with the gifts, the location could also be incorporated into the verb for location -y ones, like the valency increasing derivation that adds ideas of under or towards to a base verb. Yeah, I think that's the idea with having under be the verb here. Um, um, the thing that's tricky here, if I make tree like an agent, sort of, what, I'm calling it agent now because that's what I'm grouping, um, but if I make the tree in that same case, it's not that the tree is going under the person, it's that the tree is undering the person, which is kind of causing them to be under, which is not what I wanted the gift thing to be. Um, another possibility that I'm thinking of is having tree not have a case and say that hmm, under the tree so I need under to because that's their relationship they have I can't just cut that out the way I can cut gift out of carrot um, or cut giving out of this carrot situation I think I need tree to do something um, I think in both of these because hmm. in B, what I have going on is person, like person is the agent, they are undering, and tree is what they're undering. It means like what they're going under. Um, kind of like the hair is what where the gift is going, the tree is where the person is undering. <laughs> um, 
tree gives under to the person. Yeah, that's the issue I'm having. Um, <laughs> the tree gives under to the person. That's that's not quite what's happening. Although we could say that that is what, what's happening. We could go that route. We could say that the tree gives under to the person. Um, because what, what I'm thinking I actually want to do, spoilers, I guess, is I think I want, I do want a minor animacy hierarchy. And so I could use, like, flipping expectations to get these different ideas across. Um, but I think the sticky bit is, if you have both cases, there's an idea of agentiveness or movement, and that's what I'm using for the gift thing but there's none of that happening in A. So I feel like I can't really do that in A. I can't, I don't think I can have tree be the agent. Um, one thing I was thinking about potentially in my head was having the tree be a topic, having, having the idea of a topic. And then it's just that usually the agent is also the topic, um, but not always, and having some topicalization thing happen um, that makes it pragmatically clear, like in context, that the tree is not giving under to the person um, when the tree is like the topical location if the only other thing you have is the recipient here. If you just have tree, let's say the order is like usually highest animacy, higher animacy, lower animacy, verb, let's say that's the order usually you you'd have like person tree under to say the person goes under the tree and then you'd have tree or or you'd have like person crow attack let's say person is higher than tree that would mean a person attacks crow and then you could flip that to say crow person attack to get that idea of like you've switched the roles um with tortoise and hare they're the same animacy i would say they're both animals and they're both animate um, but we could say something like the topic is usually the agent. So you could have tortoise, hare, carrot, tortoise, hare, carrot, and carrot is the verb. Um, and that means like the tortoise gives a carrot to the hare. Uh, and then you could flip that to say that the hare gives the tortoise to the carrot because the hare is now the topic. Um, if you wanted carrot to be the topic, though, that's, that's the tricky part. What if you want to make the carrot to the topic? Um, if you say carrot, tortoise hair. Carrot is lower on the animacy hierarchy. If we do that, I would have to carrot be lower. Um, so the carrot's not giving anything to anyone. <laughs> um, so you have to use the other two in order to figure out what's happening. Um, that's a very specific circumstance, but I can imagine it happening with multiple people in a sentence. So the question then becomes, what do I want to do with tree then if I use a topic here like tree is the topic I could have a like tree person under but tree there's not an agent it's just a topic not an agent and then we have person which could be I interpreted as a patient or an agent and then under is the verb it's either the person is going under like there's a tree and the person's going under which could still have the meaning of be but I've moved tree to the topic to emphasize the location. And that maybe by itself could be enough contextually to get across that like the location is what matters, not the movement, um, which kind of does the same job of almost, almost the same job of having the person be marked as a patient, if there's a patient marking or something. Um, but I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if I want to do that. If I want to have a topic, I could, Hmm. I have another idea. Some languages would express this state of situation with a reflexive verb. <laughs> um, some kind of reflexive that says that they're doing something to themselves. Like the person is doing something to themselves by making them stay there and not do anything. So one strategy I could use 
is person, person, <laughs> tree under versus person, tree under. If, if we're going in that like order of like having the verb at the end, we could say the person tree under means person like underifies themselves under a tree. The person unders the tree. They go under the tree. But person person under tree means that the person underifies themselves under a tree. That's that's three three nouns now though. Three entities before the verb. Um, we could put tree after. We could have tree be like an adverb. <laughs> That's another option in both of these situations. We don't actually have to give tree a role in either of these. It is possible to. I'm going to scratch that out because it's possible. I, or I'll, I guess I'll white, white it out. I don't want it to be too ugly. Um, we could not have anything. A lot of languages wouldn't do that. They might just say that. Under is the verb and tree is like an adverb that describes where under is. <laughs> and that's another option here. So we could just have person under and then mark tree as an adjunct to under somehow. And we could do that here too. Person as an agent under and then tree. Um, of course, that would require us to have a way to differentiate the agentiveness or the patientiveness without an extra word, <laughs> or we might need an extra word or a particle or something to mark an agent, which is possible. We could do that. I'm just very much leaning for whatever reason with this language into not having particles, <laughs> if I can avoid it. I kind of just want words um, that express entities and um, events, if I can get away with it. So I kind of want to use order. Um, that's what I'm thinking with the syntax is using word order. Um, but it feels to me syntactically sidelining tree as an, a modifier of under, even though that's like a way of expressing the relationship that makes sense and many languages would do, it feels like spiritually wrong for the idea of like visually expressing things with visual metaphors. Putting the tree in the sidelines in a sentence where the tree is the most important thing, in my opinion, um, seem feels wrong for that semantic sort of part of the goal here to me. Um, so I kind of, I kind of feel like maybe we do need a topic, a topicalizer thing, and maybe it can also serve as that adverbial role, what is a topic? And I could do that with word order, um, by copying what I've done in a lot of other languages and having it either come after the verb or come before the verb. But I, in either case, I would like the verb to be on the boundaries of the sentence because then we could just l like list the arguments next to each other in order to express that hierarchy-like relationship. So what I'm thinking is we do keep the tree as a patient in this sentence because we have an agent. And we could say like, if we have an agent, we need a patient. Um, like no intransitive agents because there's no way to express an agent otherwise. Um, or maybe we could have an intransitive agent. It's just like ambiguous because maybe maybe this rester is an agent or a patient you can't tell. Um, but what I'm thinking is, because I need to get motion across is the thing. Um, and if under is my verb, under could be location. If you have no patient um, involved or like no and this is the thing I'm thinking this makes sense to me even though it maybe doesn't make sense to someone watching this um, it makes more sense to me because accusative which is like often the direct object case in nominative accusative languages or is the accusative it is the it's what it is in nominative accusative languages the direct object the accusative is also often used for um, uh, destination of motion in Indo-European languages. And part of this is probably because the accusative probably actually comes from an old allative or dative case in pre-Indo-European or the early Proto-Indo-European when it, back when it was still active stative purely or ergative or something like that. Um, the, the accusative in most Indo-European languages is probably originally dative because um, the old accusative was like zero marked 
which probably meant it was absolutive and not accusative. But that's a story for another day. <laughs> um, so that makes a lot of sense to me. And when, when you use prepositions with like the accusative, it usually means motion versus you know, with another case it means it's um, location. That's kind of what I'm going to express with adverbials here. So here's what I'm thinking for syntax. And now we can actually maybe even like get the syntax thing figured out. Um, I'm thinking we go, do I want to go verb initial or verb final? <laughs> With particle languages, I tend to go verb initial. Actually, with a lot of languages, I go verb initial. Um, or I go verb final. Um, especially when I have like non, like languages with very little inflection, I usually put verb final. I usually go arguments, then verb. But I might do verb initial again. Maybe we'll do verb initial. Sort of a VSO kind of thing. Yeah, because then I like that because then I can topicalize by putting something before the verb by putting it first <laughs> instead of putting it at the end. So I'm going to go um, I'm going to go AJX. I usually use that for adjunct um, or like contextual CTX um, or topic. Mm, but not all topics are going to go before the verb, I think is my point. Um, it's not any time there's a topic. It's just like a topicalized thing that doesn't have a role. So I'm going to call this, I guess I'll just call it adverbial. And I might be doing something kind of weird with head modifier here. I think I might have modifier head, but still have the verb at the beginning. Um, so like basically what I'm saying is like adjectives come before the, the noun. Mod head. Um, yeah, adjunct or ad, ad, adverb, and then I'm going to have verb, and then I'm going to have um, uh, agent, and then I'm going to have patient. Um, Yeah. Something like that for this syntax. So let me let me write out how each of these will be. A, B, C, D. So it's gonna go. So A is gonna be the weirdest one. I think it's gonna have tree be an adverb. So it's gonna have like I guess the problem, the one problem I'm seeing here <laughs> still is without some kind of other marking, I don't know if the first word is an adverb and then the second word is a verb, or if um, it is the verb. <laughs> I, I guess that would be a potential problem. So maybe I need some kind of marking that the thing is the verb. Maybe I will have particles. And then I can use the particles for some cool um, some cool semantic stuff. Maybe I could do something like, I don't know. Um, maybe I could do something with the um, tense or aspect or elocutionary force or something there. Um, it'll be like adverb. I'm going to write TMV. Tense, aspect, mood, um, voice, and evidentiality. Actually, voice is going to be done with the... Um, word order, so I'm just going to do tame, T-A-M-E, um, that is illegible. A lot of whiteout today. All right, so tame. Um, and there could also be a potential problem with this. I'll probably need some kind of like modifier marker. Um, I put an E here because I'm thinking of what um, Farsi does. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just my way of saying that there's going to be something linking the modifiers to their heads uh, morphologically, probably. Um, so how am I going to do A? The typical way I'm going to do A is I'm going to say it's going to go tree. I'll, I'll use um, 
a capital T as an abbreviation for tame there. Um, that's what um, that's what generative syntacticians do. Um, I'm not a generative syntactician, but that's what they do. Um, they use T usually. Tree, something. Um, and then it's going to go under is the verb, and then person. And I could even do person, person still, the sort of reflexive -y thing if I wanted to make it very clear. Um, yeah, I think what I'm going to do is for overall, if there's any third thing here, this will be like, yeah, esafe. That's what it's called, the, the, the Farsi thing. Yeah, it's the most fun, aesthetically pleasing part of Farsi. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> um, uh, and then it's like oblique is here. So if I weren't fronting tree here, I think what I would probably do is I would say, I would say that like the reflexive is mandatory. <laughs> I would say like, I'd have to say my, my particle under person, person tree, <laughs> just to make sure that the tree is not interpreted as the patient, because that's what B will be. B will be my tense aspect mood voice thingy. And then, you know, maybe I'll put the tense aspect mood after the verb. That might actually be better because then I can tell where the verb ends. And then you can kind of see how tree and under go together. Um, yeah, I think I might move this. Um, I'm actually going to put it here instead. under t kind of keeps all the verby stuff together the adverb um and then that also I, the other th reason i like that is because it kind of mirrors maybe i could do the same kind of as a thing that i do with um modifier head like that will also happen with it it'll be like tree some kind of connector then under to sort of emphasize the tree's importantness and then person, and then I could say person, and then another person, and then tree, if I didn't want a front tree here. And then I could potentially do the same thing with carrot, right? I could like say, how is how is the tortoise carroting the hare? They're um, I don't know. Um, with gratitude, <laughs> gratefully carroting the hare. Um, something like that. So yeah, tree under particle person or under particle person person tree. <laughs> now here we're going to have under t person tree. When I say person person, I probably would have a reflexive pronoun so that I don't have to say person twice, um, but just like some kind of pronoun that's like themselves, <laughs> um, not repeating the pro the whole word um so that would be that would be b c would be um attack i'll probably have the verb for attack or something and then my particle that shows that the verb is done and then i'd have crow person because i'm going to say that they're the same animacy so i'm going to use the order to differentiate those um and then d would be carrot as my verb carrot, particle, and then tortoise and hare are on equal footing, so they need to be ordered uh, tortoise, hare, carrot, tortoise, hare, carrot, something, tortoise, hare, <laughs> under something, person, tree, and the T is going to be my particle, and then between tree and under, there's going to be some kind of a link, potentially, like as a fair or something, or maybe I don't need it. Oh, no, no, I do need it because it's going to happen. Maybe I don't need it with adverbs, but I do need it with nouns. Mm, no, I'd rather just keep it together. Maybe for fun aesthetic reasons, it would be nice to have some kind of linker there. So the things that are getting expressed within their own word, I'm going to highlight in, in gray here um, in both the pictures and my list, I think. Um, so I'm going to go like, so the tree gets a word. No, that's wrong tree gets a word, person gets a word, under gets a word. 
tree person under again, and we're using syntax to distinguish. Crow person attack, tortoise hair carrot. So gift, state, and motion are not getting their own words, but attack is getting its own word because there isn't a way to say, you can't just say crow and person and know that one of them is attacking the other, but you can say these and kind of infer that there's some kind of motion here because giving is often classed as a kind of motion um, when you're categorizing things. So again, I'm gonna do that up here, down here in this list of tree, person, under, tree, person, under, crow, person, attack, tortoise, hair, carrot, okay. Um, so that's the syntax part and it's already been an hour and a half. I'm already a half hour over what I was planning to stream today and I kind of want to keep going, <laughs> but I don't want to keep us here all day. So I've used one page and gotten through goals, semantics, and syntax, um, at least this aspect of the syntax, the um, alignment stuff. Um, and I think honestly, like the mod head also, if I do that, that kind of covers most of the stuff. I think the only thing I have to think about is how am I going to coordinate things? Um, like if I want several sentences in a row. But remember that this is a fun, single-use demonstrating language. So um, I am going to probably try to figure out a way to do that, but um, I don't need to think, I don't need to like go crazy <laughs> with all the different coordinates. Like, am I going to have and, but, or, so? Um, I could probably just think of like, how would I string two sentences together? How am I going to do that grammatically? Um, and to think about that, that's going to get us into morphology. So. Of the six <laughs> squares, we got uh, three of them. So halfway, I'm going to put that in quotes because some of these things take more time. Um, but we got a lot of this language um, figured out. So all of this on paper with a pen. I didn't look up anything. I mean, that's not super impressive for today because this is all very conceptual stuff. But next time we're going to get into morphology, phonology, and orthography. and um, uh, these are the parts that people tend to like use tech for because it makes it easier, but we're going to do it on paper and pencil, maybe probably on this page here. Um, so tune in in two weeks for that. Next week we are reading, um, Bisclavreth. I started it last week, but I had a ton of technical issues. So we're actually going to start it over. We're going to start from the beginning again. Um, gay werewolf, old French poetry. It's super cool. Um, so stay tuned for that next week. It's perfect for October. I wanted to read something about a werewolf. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you uh, for everyone who participated in the chat. I appreciate it so much. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of whatever time zone you're in. Thank you and farewell.